Good morning, church. I'm, I'm from Texas, so usually people talk a little louder. Uh, I thought everything was bigger in Texas till I saw some mountains this week. Uh, I've been uh, friends with your pastor for a number of years, led worship together. Oh, what, we didn't lead worship together. I led worship at the church that uh, he was on at in uh, Dallas. So uh, I'm glad to be here with you guys this morning. Let's stand as we sing to our risen Savior, Jesus. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met I was breathing but
We pour out our praise at your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you all.
Heavenly Father, it is well because of you and you alone. Lord, I thank you for being there. I thank you for always being our friend, our Father. We can go to you whenever we need, in times of joy, in times of sorrows. You will never leave us or forsake us, and I praise you, and I love you, and I give you all the thanks that's due to me. In your precious name, amen. Please remain standing. And you guys can, you guys stay standing. So this morning, while we were um, rehearsing and this room was empty, and we were just worshiping before, I was praying, sitting third row, right in the center, praying, and uh, loved this song. And um, as I was praying, I kind of got this impression that we oftentimes tried to hold on to things and control them, right? Tried to manipulate circumstances, control circumstances, people, if it's a health thing, a financial thing, a job thing, a transition thing, but we, we hold on to it. Um, and 
we get so frustrated or so discouraged um, because something's not happening the way we want it to or, and we just keep trying to hold on to it, right? And trying to get it to be or that person to be or that job to be or that transition to be the thing that we want it to be. And, um, as we were singing this song, this idea came to my thoughts that this song declares the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And that this song, and it, when we sing it as well, it is almost like we are singing out the control. We're, we're taking the thing and just saying, God, I'm going to put it into your hands. And it's okay with me. It is well with me. Whatever happens, because of your goodness, because of your righteousness, because of your holiness, because of your faithfulness, because of your mercy. And I feel like there's probably, I mean, I know me, there's th place, times where I, and people and circumstances I'd like to control. And so I want to actually sing that again. And what I'd like for us to do is just kind of prayerfully think about whatever that might be, that person or that thing, that control. And I also want us at the same time to think about God's goodness and his faithfulness, his mercy, his kindness. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. And I want us to, as we sing this song, almost to sing the control out if that makes sense. That's the best way I can communicate it. Just whatever that thing is we're trying to control, just sing it out. And in the midst of singing it, just say, God, I'm, because of your goodness, because of your faithfulness, I'm just going to put this thing in your hands. And however it turns out, it is well with me. It is well with me. So we're going to go into a time and Shelly's going to lead us in singing that. We pray, Father, we rejoice in your goodness and your faithfulness. We rejoice that you never leave and you never forsake. We rejoice in your mercy. Lord, you're the provider. You're the healer. You're the Savior, Lord. And we just declare that this morning. And we just ask, Lord, that there, there may be some chains that we ask to be broken. And we ask, Lord... Um, that we just want to give you room to move in the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, and transform our hearts, transform our lives. All for your glory and your renown in Jesus' name. Amen. And with that, you guys can be seated. Amen. Well, happy birthday. <laughs> it's all good. Hey, um, we're so great, grateful that you joined us today. It's been 
It's been a celebration, and we'll see if I can get through another sermon here with my voice today, but it's been fantastic, but we're about to go into a time of offering, and um, before we pass the baskets, this week I, I heard um, from another leader that when you have a vision that you believe is good for all people, that you pursue it without compromise. And so Crow Hill Bible Church exists so that the lost are found and the broken are restored in Jesus Christ. And Crow Hill Bible Church wants to be a church that reproduces itself. We want to be a church that plants churches. We want to be a church that identifies people and raises them up and allows them to use their gifts and their abilities to advance the kingdom here. We want to be a church that is a good neighbor for our community. We want to be a church that is intentional about spreading the gospel both locally and globally. And I believe and our elders believe and our staff believes that that is a vision that is good for everybody. And so as you consider partnering with us and giving to this church, I want you to know that we will pursue that mission and that vision without compromise. You have my word on that. And so we would love for you to prayerfully consider partnering with us to continue to find the lost and restore the broken. And as the baskets are being passed, check out this video of some ways you can connect here at Grow Hill Bible Church. Hey, Crow Hill, thanks for joining us and welcome to Baptism and Membership Sunday. It's one of our favorite Sundays of the year. Isn't that right, Dave? That's right. Four times a year. It's one of the best days that we have all year. Absolutely. So thanks for being here and celebrating with those who are baptized and who are becoming members. It's such an honor. Um, for you guys to join us and for us to celebrate that today. If you um, did not bring a check or cash with you today and you'd like to partner with us here at Crow Hill Bible Church, you can text this number. You can put in the dollar symbol, the amount, click the send tab, and it will be on its way to our bank account. And then you can also go to chbc.online. You can click the give tab and sign up for reoccurring giving. We would love for you to partner with us here at Crow Hill Bible Church as we continue to find the lost and restore the broken in Jesus Christ. Hey, if you're new here, we're just so honored and excited that you're here. We hope today's service is meaningful and enjoyable for you, and we'd love to get to know you just a little bit after service at the Connect table in the lobby. We'd love to get just a little bit of information so we can keep you up to date on everything that's going on here at Crow Hill, and we've also got a free gift bag for you, so we'd love for you to stop and pick one up. Yeah, yeah, and so one of the events that we're excited about is that she, uh, Ministry for Women, is going to kick off this new ministry by with a six-week course to teach women how to study Scripture and learn it on their own. And they're going to be going through the book of James, just like we're going through for our Collide series. And so we would love for you to sign up for that. It starts um, on May the 15th. It'll be right here in the worship center. You can go to the connect table after the service and sign up for it. You can go to chbc.online and uh, sign up for the class. And if you have any other questions, some of our impression team members would love to answer those questions for you. We're excited about this event and we'd love for you to participate uh, if you're a woman yeah. here today. Hey, wasn't, wasn't there something else we were going to talk about today? It's like may the fifth be may, with you. May, no, that's not. No, that's not. Either. Cinco de Mayo? Yeah, I mean, that's a day. It's today. But, but we don't really talk about, or why would we talk about now. that here? Isn't it, isn't, there's like a birthday or something. There is a birthday. Who, is it uh, Pastor Jeroys? No, I thought it was Pastor Jerry. Jeron? Gerald. Oh, uh, Geraldo. That's close. How about Jared? Pastor Jared's <laughs> birthday Pastor today. Pastor Jared, happy birthday Today, you are 15 years old. Woo, woo. <laughs> no, he's not really 15 years old. But seriously, Jared, we love you, man. Uh, you have been such an amazing addition to our CHBC family. And uh, we are so excited to be your friend and to do ministry with you. Happy birthday to you, yeah. sir, this morning. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. We're so excited you're here. Pretty soon it won't be morning anymore. Uh, so last week I gave you guys an update on our building. And what I said is that um, this week we, have, we were having a meeting. And we were going to talk about uh, where we're at in the process of our building. And um, we've been raising money for less than a year, just less than a year. And you guys have been 
unbelievably generous. Actually, um, we have taken in of the amount pledged um, back in May of 2018. We've actually taken in 113% of that toward the building because of you guys' generosity. It's great. So thank you guys so much for <clears throat> giving and, and being um, sacrificial in your giving. And uh, so this week we were going to be at a shortage, and uh, that's what I told you guys last week. We have a shortage, and we didn't know exactly how much that was, but I will give you an update this week. And, and what I said is let's exercise one of our core values, which is ceaseless prayer. And uh, thank you guys. You guys text me this week. You text me on Monday. Some of you were, oh, I thought it was Monday. I don't know, but you were praying on Monday. And uh, some, a lot of you were texting me on Wednesday. Hey, we're praying for you, praying for the meeting. Can't wait to hear what's going on or, or whatnot. And so we started the meeting about 11 a.m. on Monday. I meant, sorry, Wednesday. And um, when we started the meeting, we tallied up the amount of money that we have in the bank and the amount that we are, the, the loan that we're going for. It, versus the cost of the building, of the overall project, and we were $86,000 short. And the loan company we're working with is Converge, which we're a part of, and so we, we would pay money to them, and they actually help build churches, plant churches. It's a fund that actually helps advance the kingdom, so we're okay with that. Yeah. And um, so we're $86,000 short um, when we started 11 a.m. Um, and by the time we finished at 1 p.m., we were at a $7,000 surplus. <laughs> um, so he, here's, what the, here's what that means, that with the loan that we have and the amount of money that has been given um, to this date, we have enough projected to cover the entire amount for the cost of the project. And the timeline looks like uh, start of July, mid-July, we will begin to break ground on our new extension, our new facility here at Crow Bible Church. Isn't that amazing? It's awesome. So um, there's still prayer involved, okay? So we have um, permits are out to the county. That's about six to eight weeks. So if you guys could be praying for that, that everything kind of goes smoothly and that God gives us favor with the county. Um, we still have to get to the point of closing on the loan, and so there's still some hoops to jump through, some you know, detail things to, to go through. And so I'm going to encourage you, continue to pray, um, continue to exercise ceaseless prayer um, as we go through the process, and we'll update you along the way. Uh, two more encouragements. One, if, you're, if you've pledged, um, back in May or maybe along the way, my encouragement is please be faithful with that pledge. So we're stepping forward in faith that that is going to be fulfilled. Um, and so it's converged. So if you pledged, uh, please fulfill that pledge. Be faithful with it. If you run into some issues, we can work with you. Just let us know. Um, but please be faithful with the pledge. And the second thing is, is if you haven't partnered with us yet to, to in our onward campaign to see this extension um, you know, come to fruition, now's the time to to get on board, right? Now's the time to do it. Um, and so you can go to the Connect table and get signed up or get some more information on how to give. You can go to us, also go to chpc.online and you can click, about, click and find out some information about our building and how to give to it. And we would love for you to partner with us as we continue to, to build this tool uh, to use to reach more people with the gospel. And uh, it'll be the first time that this church in over 30 years will be able to actually build their own facility. And that is amazing to see how God has moved in the last three and a half years and how he even moved on Wednesday. So that's great. So last thing, the, the, the real MVP, most valuable player in this, is prayer. And so the building's exciting, but Wednesday, what happened Wednesday is a testimony of what happens when God people, God's people come together and pray. Right, It's a testimony of what happens and how God can move. And so let's continue to pray. Let's continue to have ceaseless prayer. Let's continue to, to press in on the Lord. And we'll continue to see him do some amazing things. But I thought you might enjoy that announcement this morning. Right, That's good. Okay, so we're hopping into James um, chapter 1. We're going to be in the last part of that. Uh, last week we did James 2 through 18, 1, 2 through 18. This week will be James 1, 19 through 27. All um, of the scriptures will be up on the screen for you. And this is what we said last week, 
James is writing to a group of believers. They have already put their faith in Jesus. They're already following Jesus. They're Jewish Christians who are dispersed in the land. They're going through trial. And James writes to encourage this group in the midst of trial, but also to encourage them in sound doctrine and sound practice of that doctrine. And last week we said, or what we found in James is that trials are necessity. They're not avoidable. We're going to go through trials, but they're a necessity. And trials are a necessity for maturity. And trials also reveal our need for God. It reveals that we cannot go through life on our own. And we said that God honors the fight. God honors the faithfulness in the midst of a trial. So that's last week. So this week, James is going to come back and he's going to say, all right, so that trials are necessity. You're going to go through them. How do we respond in the midst of trials? So this week, we're going to talk about how we respond in the midst of trials. And when I think about trials, I think about kids. Um, If you have kids, if you've been around kids, if you've worked with kids, like that's a trial. They are just a trial in itself. Um, And so um, I was thinking about a time where we were in Target, we were coming out, and uh, any time that it comes time to load our children into their car seats, um, it is, you know, a mixed bag of what we're going to get. And so our youngest, Micah, he's two years old, we call him the honey badger. And so Micah, getting him into a car seat is just a feat, okay? And so we, we put him in the car seat. And immediately he kicks and screams, no, no. And he's just kicking and kicking and he's like sliding down the seat. So like you're, you're trying to like pull him up and he's like, no. And he just puts all of his weight at the bottom and he's not getting in a seat and he's freaking out everywhere, you know, and we're bribing him. Hey, how about fruit snacks? Like we can give you fruit snacks if you just get in your seat, you know? And he's like, no, okay, we'll take you to get ice cream. If you'll just get in your seat, no, you know, just, we're just bribing him and bribing him and bribing him and he's kicking and he's screaming. Now, in the meantime, there are people passing by, okay, and people are passing by, and they're just giving you that look. Have, have you ever, you know, know that, like parents, grandparents, people who work with kids, like you're, the kids are freaking out, and they just give you that look, like, yeah, if I was in that situation, I would be owning that child right now. You are not, um, and they just give you the look, and you just kind of feel like, man, I'm a horrible parent. And so all of a sudden these people are passing by. So I just take Micah and I grab him and I just put him in the seat. And then I take my arm and I'm like pushing him down, cutting off his circulation and his breathing, trying to get him to stay there. Like Caleb's on the other side of the car, like trying to help us buckle him in. And like Sarah's reaching over the the car seat, like trying to buckle him in. And you're like, how can something that weighs 25 pounds monopolize an entire family? (laughs) Right? And so you're just trying to finally you get him in, and he's like, can I have a fruit snack? No, you can't have a fruit snack now. You could have like five minutes ago, but now you can't have a fruit snack. So here's the the thing. Sometimes we just have to do whatever's necessary to get the kid in the car seat. That's not the problem. But what happens is in the midst of that situation, the way that I responded, the way that Sarah responded with our mouth, probably what we were saying, and with our actions, did not give off the best impression of the values that we hold as a family. So people walking by were probably about ready to call CPS or something on us, right? But it doesn't give off, like, the right attitude of what we want people to believe the values of our family are. And I bet that you guys have been in a similar situation before whether it be talking to a spouse, talking to a friend, a situation at work, a situation with finance, a prolonged period of time that is very difficult, I would imagine that we all have had moments where we have responded to something that is hard or responded to a trial or a circumstance, and the way we responded did not communicate the values that we actually try to live by. And so what James is going to teach us and answer this question, this is what we're going to hope to do, is what does responding well look like in the midst of trials? What does responding well look like in the midst of trials? So, um, (coughs) pardon me, I've talked a lot today, shouted a lot, so I'll probably have to have some water, you know, it's all good. But this is a message, if you are a follower of Jesus, this is a message for you, and it's a message for me. Because it's James writing to us and saying, your trial is inevitable, and here's actually how we 
respond to them and, how, and who we're representing and why it's important to respond well to trials. If you are watching this, listening to this, and you are not a follower in Jesus, then you're kind of off the hook this morning. But here's the thing that I want you to do. I want you to listen to how believers are to respond, how followers of Jesus are to respond in trials. And when you see a person who professes to follow Jesus not respond in a good way, you hold them accountable for me. Okay? And you can tell them, your pastor told me to hold you accountable. Okay, So you have my permission to do that. So what does responding well look like in the midst of trials? This is what James writes, James 1, 19. It's up on the screen for you. Know this, my beloved brothers. So just like last week, he starts with brothers, and then he comes down and talks about beloved brothers. And what we said last week is it's like James is grabbing your face, and he's like pulling you in and saying, hey, brothers and sisters, I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen closely to me. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And so the way I've broken this up is we're going to take about two or three passages each, and I'm going to give you kind of a contrasting attitude that we can respond to trials in in this passage. So from 19 through 21, what I've said is the contrasting attitude that James is talking about is we can respond with trials in anger or with patience. So you've got anger versus patience. Anger is quick to speak. Anger is inept at listening. And anger is quick to judgment. (coughs) Pardon me. If you've ever been around an angry person, you'll know that an angry person overreacts to unmet expectations. You've ever been around someone like that? An angry person blames individuals. They punish people. They deny responsibility for their own failures. That's what an angry person does. But James says, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls, meaning which is able to correct you. The word of God is able to correct you. And another word for meekness in my study is patience. Another word is to receive with patience the implanted word because patience is quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. If you've ever been around a patient person, they ask good questions. Patient people are quick to extend grace. Patient people take time to discern the root of the issue before reacting to a problem. And patient people recognize that there are very few emergencies in life, that we don't always have to be reactive in life. So James, in this first three verses, in the midst of trial, instructs us to respond in the midst of trial with patience, but not in anger. When we are met with a trial, what we want to do is we want to respond with patience. We want to seek God. We want to ask him to grow us and mature us from an emotional, relational standpoint, and we want to respond in that place, in that trial, with patience, but not in anger, okay? Verse 22, we'll move on to the next section. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So he's saying, like, look, if you are just a hearer and not a doer, if you don't act on the word, then you just deceive yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who intently looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. In verse 24, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks in the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. We'll get to verses 24 and 25 in about an hour. But first, I want to talk about 22 and 23. What I think the contrasting attitudes that James is talking about is, in the midst of trial, are we going to respond with passivity or in obedience? Are we going to respond with passivity or in obedience? Now, trials often force us to be passive. They are emotionally draining on us, physically draining on us to go through a trial. So sometimes when we're emotionally tired and we're physically tired, we just want to be passive. We just want to forget about it. We want to disconnect. We want to retreat. I'm guilty of the same thing. Trials also destroy our spirit takes away our expectation and our hope, our joy. So often in the midst of trials, it seems easier to be complacent and to grow passive 
rather than enter into obedience in the midst of trial. So what we want to do is we want to reject passivity. This is what James is saying. Hey, reject passivity and be obedient to God's word. And being obedient actually means being faithful. And the thing that I've learned about faithfulness is you can't teach it. You cannot teach someone to be faithful. Faithfulness is an overflow of the heart. It is not a skill that you can teach. And so what James is saying is like, look, you go through trials, don't pull back, don't grow passive, but be obedient to God's word and be a doer of God's word, what he's calling you to do. Reject passivity, take up obedience. Be faithful to something. Be faithful in that season. Be faithful to the spouse. Be faithful to your job. Be faithful to that horrible boss. Like, be faithful in that season. So James is instructing us that when we go through trials, when we respond to trials, we want to resist passivity and we want to embrace obedience. We want to embrace it. We want to welcome it. We want to like be in there and like, yep, I'm going to be obedient to this in the season. So we've got respond with patience, not in anger, resist passivity, and embrace obedience. And then 26 through 27, this is what um, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who holds nothing back, by the way, he holds nothing back, says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, bridling is something that they would, you would put over a horse to kind of control the horse. So if anyone thinks he is religious and does not control his or her tongue, and here's deceives again, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. I'm just going to sit there. So if we cannot control our tongue, if we can't bridle it, our James, the half-brother of Jesus who holds nothing back, says that our religion is absolutely worthless. Verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And so what I think James is describing in this section, 26 through 27, is this difference in attitude of pride versus servanthood. Pride versus servanthood. Now, here's how I came up with the word pride when we're talking about taming the tongue. Uh, C.S. Lewis um, the famous um, philosopher and a, um, of the Christian religion, he said that gossip is a manifestation of pride and that pride is the essential vice and the ultimate evil. And he said that anyone who is operating out of pride, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And if, a go- and if there is a gossiper, they are always looking down on things, on circumstances, situations, right, and people. They're always looking down on them, okay? What I would like to say is that pride leads to gossip, and to me, gossip is detestable. I preached a sermon on this last year, and somebody after that sermon was like, you really don't like gossip. And I don't like gossip because it is the tool that the enemy uses over and over and over and over again to bring divisiveness in relationships and divisiveness in the church. So to me, gossip is detestable. It is deceptive. It is divisive. And it's petty. We just got to be better. We just got to grow up. Like as a body, as a group of believers, we got to grow up. Okay? Gossip seeks revenge. It seeks superiority. And it seeks control. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Any time we're in relationship with anyone... There is never a perfect relationship. When there is disunity in a relationship, when someone does something to you or, does, or you do something to them or whatever, what we want to do is we don't want to go around and tell all of our friends about what someone else did or who they are or all that kind of stuff. What we want to do is we want to go to the person one-on-one and work it out. It's easy to go and tell all of our friends what someone did to us. It's hard to go to a person and say, hey, when you said this, when you did this, when this happened, it hurt me. It made me angry. It made me feel alone. And I'm coming because I want to work this out. So we go to the people that can handle the situation. Okay? Con- so in that sermon, I said concerns go up, meaning 
concerns about a person go up to someone who can handle it, praise goes out. Praise goes out, concerns go up. So we do not want to respond with pride. We do not want to respond with gossip. We want to control the tongue. We want to bridle the tongue. So what we want to do is resist pride and with humility. And the way that we combat revenge, superiority, and control is by offering ourselves up to serve others. Because you cannot serve someone and seek their revenge. And you cannot serve someone and look at yourself as being superior to them. And you cannot serve someone and try to control them. It just doesn't happen. You can't do it. There's not enough room in your heart. There's not enough emotion to go around to do that. So what we want to do is um, turn from pride and take up servanthood. That's what we want to do. If you ever, I, I, um, you get freebies. I, I didn't share this in the first service. I've shared this a couple times in service. I was working on a dock at Forward Air, worked there for about a year before I left Atlanta to move to Dallas. And me and this, this guy on the dock, we just had a really rough time for like the first six months, just a really bad time. And I didn't like him, and he didn't like me, and I was like, oh, he's so horrible. He's a horrible boss. He yells at me for no reason. I mean, you guys have had, right? You, everybody has horrible bosses, except for Dave and Jared. They have a really good boss. <laughs> just saying. Um, and I was praying about the situation, and you know what? God led me to do? Serve him. Go to McDonald's, because the guy liked McDonald's. Go to McDonald's, get the biggest breakfast, coffee, orange juice, show up to work at 4.30 in the morning and hand it to him. That's ridiculous. No, that's what I want you to do. Okay, I did that. You know what? For the next six months that I worked there, we didn't have any issues. When we serve people, we can't gossip. We can't operate in pride, right? So James, the half-brother of Jesus, is saying, guys, turn from pride and take up servanthood, okay? Now, when we respond to trials, we are setting an example for others, we are setting an example for other followers of Jesus, and we are setting examples for non-followers of Jesus. So however we respond in the midst of trial, it is going to give off an impression of who God is and what the church is. So we have to recognize that we're not playing on our own team. Like when you sign up to follow Jesus, like we're not playing on our own team. It ain't about us anymore. It's about the church, and then it's about him, and what we do, we represent him, and we represent the church, and I believe that the church is the greatest hope in the world, and people don't have an issue with Jesus. People have an issue with church people. If you've ever read about why people don't come to church, they have an issue with me. They have an issue with you, and I can only help but think that's because of how we've responded, right? That's how we've responded to things, and so... Here's what we want to do. Our response to trials will communicate who God is and what the church is. And so if I were to take those three statements that I've used for each section, respond with patience, not in anger, resist passivity and embrace obedience, turn from pride and take up servanthood, I would wind, like, kind of bring those two ahead and say this, that when we are in the midst of trials, what James, the half-brother of Jesus, is encouraging us to do, how we're to respond, is we're to pursue righteousness and to avoid deception. We're to pursue righteousness and avoid deception. And what I mean by deception is we want to avoid acting in an unrighteous way so that we don't, do not deceive people in who God is and what the church is. You guys may know Steph Curry. Steph Curry is a basketball player. He's fantastic. He's a believer. Last year, he was in a game and um, he was very frustrated with the referee. And so during the game, he took his mouthpiece out, threw it at the ref. He was ejected. He comes up for the post-game press conference. And they ask him about it. And he said, you know, in that moment, I forgot who I'm playing for. It's like I'm playing for Jesus. I forgot who I'm playing for. He's like, so I've gone to that ref and gone ahead and apologized. Even if initially we respond poorly, there's always a way to go and respond well. And show people repentance, right? And receive grace from the Lord. And so, but if we don't pursue righteousness and we deceive, when we operate out of anger or selfishness or pride, what people do is they begin to see Jesus and the church as judgmental, not gracious, exclusive, not inclusive, angry, not merciful, stingy, not generous, prideful, not humble. 
And when we respond with unrighteousness, we deceive others about who God is and what the church is. Because we're not playing on our team. This is not Josh's team. I'm playing on God's team and the church's team. And if I'm out wreaking havoc, and oh, I'm the pastor of Crow Hill Bible Church, guess what everybody's going to think about is us in here. We wreak havoc. We don't want that. And what are they going to think about God? He wreaks havoc, and he doesn't. But James, the half-brother of Jesus, is correcting our practice, and he's instructing us to respond with patience, to respond in the midst of trials with obedience, to respond in the midst of trials by taking up servanthood or serving people, because then people begin to see Jesus and the church as gracious, not judgmental. Because we can't be judgmental when the one we serve values grace over judgment. That's next week's sermon. They begin to see the church as inclusive, not exclusive. We cannot be exclusive to people when Jesus died for all. They begin to see the church as patient, not angry. We cannot be angry when it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. When we respond in the midst of trials with patience, obedience, and service, they begin to see God in the church as generous, not stingy. We cannot be stingy when we serve the one who calls himself the provider. And if you need any other testimony that God is the provider, Remember the meeting that happened on Wednesday where we went from 86,000 deficit to 7,000 surplus? He's the provider. And when we respond with patience, obedience, and service, they begin to see God and the church as humble and not prideful. We cannot be prideful when the one that we serve humbled himself, even to the point of the cross. And the one that we follow, Jesus, calls us to serve others. The Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served. I mean, it did not come to be served, but to serve. We're right here, girl. We're good. So when we operate in patience, obedience, and servanthood, what happens then is that we become advocates of righteousness, and we give a true depiction of who God is in the church. And people are like, oh, I want to play on that team. I want to be on that team, because that's different than all the other teams. I want to be on that. We, we were at a, Sarah and I were at a, a Georgia-Boise State game. I'm a huge Georgia fan, if you guys don't know. Um, and Boise State just destroyed us. It was so sad. Um, they just destroyed Georgia. And toward the end of the game, when everybody knew Boise State was going to win, there were some Georgia fans sitting in the aisle, and they were throwing bottles at the Boise State fans. And, the, and the, some of the other Georgia fans around them said, whoa, 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 stop. Like, that's not what we're about. We don't do that. They beat us. We've received the beating humbly. We don't throw things at people. We don't yell at people. We don't cuss at people. That's not what we're about. That's not the values of our, of our team. Patience, obedience, and service in times of trial convey the heart of God to others and produces the fruits of the Spirit, and it conveys the true values of our team, which is the team of God and, and his bride, the church. But here's the thing. Jesus says that these issues, pride and selfishness and envy and anger, they come from the heart. Jesus said in Matthew 15, he taught that whatever goes into the mouth goes into the stomach and out of the body. But whatever comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And in the heart lies envy and anger and lust and greed and gossip and slander. In James 1, 24 through 25, James gives us a way to kind of examine our heart to help us deal with trials and help us respond well in the midst of trials. And this way says, verse 24 and 25, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, the word of God, the gospel, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. What James, the half-brother of Jesus, is instructing us to do is to intentionally set aside time to observe our heart and to observe our character. And so the question is, how many of us are consistently evaluating our character or evaluating our heart? 
And the reason we need to evaluate our character and evaluate our heart is because we all have blind spots. I have blind spots. You have blind spots. We all have them. And blind spots are areas we, where we consistently fail to see ourselves realistically. That's why we have to go look in the mirror. That's why James is instructing us, go look in the mirror, evaluate your heart, see yourself realistically because your, your, the response that you have, that negative response you have in the trial, the negative response I have in the trial is probably a heart issue, not a circumstantial issue, okay? And so we have to, what we have to do is we have to observe our character and observe our heart, not up against other people. Oh, well, I'm a little bit better than she is, or I'm a little bit better than he is, but up against God's word and with help from the Holy Spirit. We got we to gotta observe our heart and observe our character with the help of God's word and what God's word is calling us to and through the help of the Holy Spirit to say, hey, where is there something in my heart that is not right? It's not righteous that I need to deal with. We don't need to, we, we can't correctly observe ourselves with personality tests and all these various things and be like, oh, well, that's how I am. That might be how you are. That might be how I am. But what I need to do is get to the heart of things. And I need to say, like Psalm 139, search me and try me, O Lord. Search me and try me and show me where there's, any unfi- where there's filthiness in my heart. And help me get over that. Right? And so, we all have blind spots. So here's three questions I'm going to put up on the screen that I asked myself this week. I would encourage you to ask yourself as well as you're considering evaluating your heart. The first one is, what am I afraid of losing? In this time, with that relationship, with that health thing, with that money thing, with that transition thing, what am I afraid of losing it? This question deals with fear, which is often often circumstantial. What am I afraid of losing? The second question is, what am I trying to hide? What am I trying to cover up? What am I trying to conceal? This deals with insecurity. Because oftentimes we want people to see us in a certain way, so we hide certain areas of our life so that they will view us in a certain way. What am I trying to, what am I trying to hide? Where's their insecurity in my heart? And the third question is, God, what am I trying to prove? This oftentimes comes to ambition. When, you, when we try to prove things to people, oftentimes we reach. We reach for other things. We reach out of what God has called us to do. There's an old term in basketball, if you reach, I'll teach. Like if you reach to try to steal the ball, I'll just go around you and I'll hit a layup. If you reach, I'll teach. If we reach, God teaches, right? Sometimes the hard way, right? So what are we trying to prove? Where are we and to whom? James is saying, come here, come here, beloved. Come close. Examine your heart. Respond well to trials because the way we respond determines or is an example of who God is and what the church is. And that when we respond to trials, what we want to do is we want to respond by pursuing righteousness. And we want to respond and avoid being deceptive because we're not on our team anymore. We're on God's team, and we represent Him and the church. Would you stand with me? As we um, get ready to close, or get ready to sing our song, our next song, I'd love for you to take this opportunity to begin to ask yourself those three questions and ask God, say, hey, Holy Spirit, what am I afraid of losing? Where are there places of fear in my life? What am I trying to hide? What am I trying to prove? Who am I trying to prove it to? Maybe you think about Psalm 139 and say, God, search and try my heart. Reveal to me any any unhealthiness, filthiness, unrighteousness in it. Reveal to me what it is so I can deal with it right here, right now with the Lord. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and mercy. You are holy, you are just, your ways are not our ways, your thoughts are not our thoughts. Lord, you are higher than we are, you are wiser than we are, and we give you honor and praise for your faithfulness, for your goodness. Lord, may you be honored, may you be glorified. Father, speak to our hearts. 
Speak to our hearts today. Examine our hearts today. Remove any unfiltiness, Lord, any rivalry, any slander, gossip, anger, frustration. I ask, Lord, you'd remove it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. What a day. <laughs> Did y'all have fun? Yes. It's good. Praise the Lord. Hey, we're so honored and so thankful that you decided to come and spend a few hours with us here today at Crow Hill Bible Church. Thanks for hanging around for our second service. What an amazing God we serve. Amen. If you uh, received Christ um, today, we have a, we'd love for you to text Jesus to 720-924-2513. We'd love to follow up with you um, with any kind of materials or anything that you'd love to have. We'd love for you to stick around and have some coffee with us. Go by the Connect table. If this is your first time, we'd love to give you a gift today just to say thank you so much for coming and worshiping with us here today at Crow Hill Bible Church. So you got to send my friend Eric off with an amazing Bailey welcome, okay? So you guys have to be super loud. <laughs> it's been great having uh, Eric with us this week, and we got a couple more days, and so it'll be fun. But let's rock and roll. We'll see you after the service, and next week, God bless you. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, is my song. You are good. Never gonna let me down. You're never.